Hello everyone, my name is Katie Morris. I'm an AmeriCorps member at Mountain True and I work with doing our education and outings programs. And so you're here today as our second installment in our Mountain True University speaker series. And Josh has agreed to speak with us today about ancient forests of the Blue Ridge. So he'll be talking about old growth in our region. Next week, we'll hear from our Western Regional Program Coordinator, Tony Ward, about native plants that you can plant instead of the common invasive ones in your yard. So same time, same place. You can sign up on our website to tune in for that one. And for those of you who are joining who aren't super familiar with Mountain True, Mountain True is a regional, so Western North Carolina and a little bit of Georgia conservation organization that works on our public lands and also our rivers and in our communities doing some energy and public transit work in communities as well. And just a quick orientation to Zoom before I pass it over to Josh. For those of you who aren't familiar, you should see that you have a chat option and also a Q&A option. And so if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A and we'll take them as we go. And if you have any sort of technical issue, just submit that in the chat. Um, I think our connection's working okay, but Josh and I had a little bit of trouble, so maybe everyone in our area is on Zoom today. Other than that, I'll turn it over to Josh to get started. Thanks, Katie, and thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to uh, discuss a topic that is uh, very dear to me, which is old growth forests. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and get this presentation started. The title of this presentation is Ancient Forest of the Blue Ridge, Legacy of the Past and Opportunity for the Future. Um, and, and yeah, we will be talking about old growth forest. A little bit about myself. Um, I actually got my start as a biologist right out of college. Um, researching old growth forests for the Southern Appalachian Forest Coalition. And over the past uh, 20 years, I've spent a uh, couple hundred days of my life, both at work and uh, on my own time, uh, exploring these places in our region and researching um, their ecology and history and uh, not the facets of old growth forests. Um, this, um, this presentation could easily be you know, an entire uh, semester course at a university, or it could be somebody's PhD project. But we're just going to talk for about half an hour. We're going to talk about, um, you know, what old growth forest actually is. Old growth forest is a term that's thrown around a lot. Um, there are a lot of definitions. Uh, I'm going to try to provide you all with just some common sense characteristics of old growth uh, and how you might recognize these forests if you ever happen to be in one. We'll talk some about how much old growth it remains in Western North Carolina and the Blue Ridge ecoregion. And we'll talk a little bit about um, old growth restoration and obstacles to protecting old growth. So this, um, this presentation is focused on the Southern Blue Ridge ecoregion. And I, I'd just like to orient folks on what that is. A lot of folks talk about the Southern Appalachians. The Southern Appalachians are a larger region. They include the Ridge and Valley and the Cumberland Plateau um, ecoregions as well. Some, some uh, authors even include the Piedmont in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, but most people mean the Southern Blue Ridge when they talk about the Southern Appalachians. These are the highest mountains in our region. And um, let's see, I feel like I might actually be on mute. Is that a possibility? Josh, we can hear you. Oh, good. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, the mute button came briefly. Um, so yeah, the Southern Blue Ridge region, often called the Southern Appalachians, but this is the Southern Blue Ridge. These are the highest mountains, the oldest rocks. Um, they are, you know, we're close to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. We get a lot of rain because of that. Uh, just uh, a very diverse environment in this region. And it leads to a diversity of forest types. So what is old growth forest? Old growth forest is a stage of forest development. It's characterized by physical attributes that you won't find in younger forests. Um, there's a ton of definitions out there on old growth and a lot of arguments about defining old growth forest. Um, probably the most cited definition comes from the world of forestry. Uh, it's uh, Oliver and Larson. Basically the concept here is that all forests initiate after some large disturbance 
uh, like a hurricane or a big fire, and they grow up for a while. And as that, that uh, first group of trees ages to a point where some of them start to die and you have other trees entering the canopy from a younger generation, that's old growth according to Oliver and Lawrence. Uh, Freilich and Reich have a more modern view on old growth in that it, it varies a lot by community and by the history of the region. And for a lot of folks, old growth is just the oldest age class of forest that is uh, currently exists in a particular forest type or a region. Uh, old growth forest is naturally more abundant in some forest types uh, due to their natural ecology and their disturbance regime and the species that make up those forests. So for example, some uh, pine forests, say a Virginia pine dominated forest, the maximum age of those trees is probably going to be around 120 years old. That's going to be very different from a hemlock dominated forest where the trees may get five, 600 years. To contrast old growth forest, which has a rather squishy definition, primary forest uh, has a very solid definition. Primary forests are forests that have never been, uh, never been logged or converted to agriculture. You know, there may have been some grazing in some primary forest, but in general, they just haven't been converted to agriculture. Primary forest can be young or old. You can have a primary forest that's never been converted to agriculture, but has experienced a stand replacement wildfire. Um, Many folks though, when they're thinking of old growth forests, they're thinking of primary old growth. They're thinking about these places that are perceived to have never been converted to human uses and have very old trees and oftentimes very large trees. Um, these are the forests that folks, folks talk about as being virgin, which is not a term that's in favor in the ecological world, but it's in very uh, you know, common usage in, in everyday conversation about forests, I would say. Um, so old growth forest and primary forest uh, well, actually, pardon me, old growth forests can be primary or secondary. So you can have a forest that was converted to human uses perhaps hundreds of years ago and has regained old growth characteristics. Great examples of this occur across the ancient Mayan empire or the um, Angkor Wat region of Southeast Asia. Um, old growth for forest restoration in this day and time, um, if we're talking about restoring to historical levels of old growth forest, definitely depends on secondary old growth. It depends on regaining some of the areas that have been changed due to human activity. So old growth forests uh, have, um, again, physical characteristics that are different from younger forests. Um, these differences primarily emerge from old trees. We're talking about dead and dying trees and the structures they create, like nesting and denning cavities, changes in bark chemistry, changes in soil profiles, and soil chemistry. Um, structural differences combined with natural disturbance genes also lead to differences in species composition for not only trees and plants, but for birds, mammals, fungi, lichen, and arthropods. So in this picture, you can see a down log laying on the ground. Well, we know uh, from the study of ecology and soil science that the zones surrounding uh, down and decaying wood have higher cation exchange capacity. That's the capacity of the soil to exchange uh, positively charged nutrients uh, with the living things in the soil. So this is a, a physical difference in, in chemical difference in old growth forest soils because they have so much down wood. So when I'm out in the, the woods looking for old growth forest or evaluating the site as old growth, there are some things to, that I look for and that you can too. One is a lack of signs of human disturbance. So don't want to see cut stumps in general, don't want to see old roads or logging paraphernalia of any sort. And a great way to evaluate that is if there's large uncut chestnut debris in the region. Um, chestnut was a commercially viable timber. It was very heavily salvaged post chestnut blight as well. So when you find large uncut chestnut uh, debris with other old growth characteristics, it's a good sign of a lack of human disturbance. Hey Josh, I'm going to jump in real quick. There seems like there's a little sure. bit of a lag between your audio and your slides. So how about you turn off mm -hmm. your video in hopes that the slides will come through more clearly. Good suggestion. I'm going to have to unshare my screen for a second. I think I did accomplish that. Let's see here. Maybe this will help. Um, 
folks uh, see the slides in real time a little better. Thanks for being patient with our technological problems in the age of uh, in the age of Zoom, folks. So another characteristic I look for in old growth forests are um, forests that are mixed age. Most of the forests in our region are, are hardwood dominated um, and tend towards uh, a mixed age structure in old growth condition. In fact, you know, early researchers didn't talk about old growth, they talked about the all aged forest. So this is a great example of, of that phenomenon where you have a couple of really large old trees in this photo. Um, and you also have some medium sized trees and you've got some uh, smaller trees and you have different canopy layers, you know, real tall trees, medium sized trees, short trees of all different ages. So that's, that's a common characteristic of old growth. Um, Old trees are, of course, a part of old growth forest. And um, it, during field work, I generally, um, you know, if I think there's any question about whether a site is old growth, I will use an increment bore, which is a hollow drill bit to extract a tree core and count the rings. I've heard enough trees at this point in my life to be able to generally tell you whether a tree is over 150 years old or over 250 years old, I'll give you a, kind of a, an estimate on that. And one of the things I've learned to look for, and there's some literature out there about that, is unusual tree structures compared to younger trees, like bark patterns. So this is a white oak. You can see this white oak has a big bald patch on one side, and then very textured ridged bark uh, on the right-hand side of the photo. Um, that contrast between balding patches and very deep furrows and, and large ridges is pretty common in old growth forest, along with things like um, large limbs and, um, you know, a, 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 the ratio of the, the limbs to the, the bowl of the tree being, uh, being pretty high. You can also see a bare scratch mark if you're really observant on this tree. Let's see, I'm gonna check in with the chat here. If there's anything I need to... Um, okay, looks like everything's going all right. <laughs> um, So another point about old trees is, you know, I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of old growth in our region because a lot of the old growth we have is in places that just can't grow old trees. So this is like a 16 inch in diameter chestnut oak growing on top of a rock pile. And um, it's just as old as the tree in the previous slide, it's about three feet. So, you know, the conditions that the tree grows in controls its size, but trees can gain great age in lots of different conditions. Snags are basically standing dead trees. Uh, and these are the kind of structures that you have in forests that don't get logged. You have trees that die of natural causes and are sitting there as skeletons, essentially, in the forest. And they provide a lot of structure for things like woodpeckers, uh, denny animals, et cetera. This particular tree has a rhododendron growing out of it about 50 feet up in the air. This is at Middle Creek Research Natural Area in the Black. Um, tree fall gaps are um, the common ways in which basically um, hardwood forests in our region regenerate. So you have older trees or large trees that fall down or maybe are blown down in a windstorm and they open up a, a gap for younger trees to grow up through because they're getting more light suddenly. Um, but you'll see a lot more tree fall gaps in older forests than you do in younger forests because you have a lot more older trees that are dying of natural causes. Josh, I'm going to jump in again really quick. It seems like your slides are still yeah. a little behind. Um, okay, should I uh, pause for just a moment? Are we on the, the slide that says coarse woody debris? We are on the tree fall gaps slide. Oh, that is well behind. Yeah, Zoom is not performing well today. Well, the next slide, you know, is, uh, is, is about coarse woody debris. So coarse woody debris is what happens when trees fall. Um, has that image come up yet, uh, Katie? We are seeing the coarse woody debris slide. Good. And thanks again for your patience, folks. Um, so coarse woody debris is just a scientific word term for uh, you know wood on the ground. Um, and coarse means large wood. So this is a, a photo of an old, large piece of oak or actually just a whole oak tree on the ground in Smoky Mountains National Park. And you can see that structures like this uh, provide 
a lot of habitat that you just don't find without these sort of structures. All of the mats of moss grow up of, um, of this tree, all the, all the saplings and herbs growing out of it, all the salamanders that are under those mats of moss, all the bugs uh, inside that wood. Uh, this is just a lot of habitat that you don't find in younger forest. And I am going to check in. We have a question uh, coming. Very interested in mycelium as it relates to the topic of old growth. Great. Well, I'll try to touch on that a bit. Um, probably don't have time to delve into that much. That's a very specialized topic when it comes to old growth. So mycelium are the underground portions of mushrooms um, and are very important to forest in general. Uh, there is um, there is good evidence that fungal communities differ in older forest versus younger forest and are generally more diverse, uh, particularly wood decomposing fungi. Uh, not so sure about the mycelium of the mycorrhizal fungi that form relationships. With um, so yeah, Zoom is not performing well. I'm not able to advance my slide. There we go. Um, hoping everyone is seeing this slide now. This is uh, showing a pit and mound formation. Uh, the pit is the area behind a tree's root ball when a tree falls, and the mound is the area of dirt that's uh, kept up on the root ball. Um, again, these are just structures you don't see generally in younger forest in great abundance. And in old forest, you can see um, you know, pit and mounds that, that are hundreds of years old, uh, forming you know, kind of a rippling topography going down a slope. Uh, you might notice that there's a road in this picture, a gravel road. This is a small old, gro old growth forest remnant off um, North Fork of Ivy Creek in Barnardsville. So in identifying old growth forest, you're going to be looking for all those traits that I just talked about. Um, you know, recognizing traits of old growth forest and visual views of old trees can help you know if you're in old growth forests. Um, the highest quality work in identifying old growth in our region has been done by experienced ecologists, field biologists, uh, foresters, historians, and other researchers. The fellow on the left-hand side of this uh, frame is Rob Mestick, and he has done more work than anyone on this topic in the Southern Blue Ridge. And it's because of Rob and other folks that we know as much as we do about old growth in our region. Uh, Rob's standing there with the, the largest known tree in Pisgah National Forest. It's a poplar about six feet in diameter uh, near Curtis Creek, North Carolina and part of the very first purchase of national forest in the East. Um, so different forest types look vastly different in their natural condition, and some don't even sometimes look like forests. Um, some old growth types may tend towards more even age structure if they have very severe disturbance frequently, while most of the forests in our region tend towards a mixed age. Um, to recognize old growth forest, it requires ecological literacy, which I'm uh, imagining a lot of folks listening in right now have. Um, but you know, part of ecological literacy is being able to um, being able to recognize different forest communities, different natural communities on the landscape. And so I'm about to take you through a few pictures of some of those forests and talk about some of their old growth characteristics. Um, but the the basic idea is that different portions of the landscape, because of their environmental variables, like elevation or aspect, or soils, geology, um, landform, uh, proximity to water, these sorts of things, they tend to grow the same types of, uh, or different types of, uh, of forest, and those patterns are repeated on the landscape. So the same types of places are gonna grow the same types of forest on the landscape. Um, in our region, the highest elevations, we have spruce fir forest that's pretty similar to the forests that you might find in Maine or Canada. These are generally above 5,000 feet in elevation. Uh, fire is extremely infrequent in these areas. Uh, the estimated fire return interval in, in these forests is greater than 1,000 years and possibly more than 5,000 years. Um, Spruce are very long lived and shade tolerant trees and they can get over 400 years old and grow in completely dense shade. So you'll have a mixed age forest in this uh, old growth type. Soils in this type are generally acidic. Um, Decomposition is slow due to the cool temperatures. Uh, so you have a very deep organic layer in the soil. Um, Carolina Northern Flying Squirrels and other wildlife in this uh, ecosystem are old growth associates, meaning that they have their very best habitat in old growth forests. Um, so you know, some of those old growth associates in this ecosystem are the Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel, Weller Salamander, and Spruce Fir Moss Spider. 
Northern hardwoods forests are generally found above 4,000 feet. I actually mistyped on this slide. They are also cool and moist. Uh, they rarely experience fire, but ice and wind are common. Um, so they can be pretty uh, gnarly and twisted as some of the trees are in this photo. They can also be quite productive if they're in a sheltered topographic place and they tend towards uh, older trees uh, and uh, more mixed age structure. Acidic cove forests are the types of forests you find along streams in our region, characterized by dense and hemlock, although of course hemlocks are really taking a beating due to hemlock woolly of Delgid. Um, also found on north and east facing slopes. Um, these are very shady and often dominated by shade tolerant species. Again, very, very much a mixed age, uh, all aged forest. A rich cove forest are your sort of your prototypical Appalachian forests. Um, they're more on north and east aspects and concave slopes. Um, you can generally identify these by their dense herb layer um, and species like uh, sugar maple, poplar buckeye. Um, this is probably the most economically attractive forest when it comes to timber and uh, conversion to agriculture as well. Uh, fire is uncommon in this forest type, but it does happen possibly on the order of, you know, uh, 70 to 200 years uh, as a return interval. And disturbance events are generally small. These forests occur in like the most protected portions of the landscape where they have ridges on either side shielding them from winds and storms, as well as being protected from fire. Um, and again, so this is a, this is a very exploited forest type. So this, you know, the previous slide was of a ancient rich cove in the Smokies with huge trees. This is what a 90 year old rich cove forest in very good condition looks like on maybe on its way back to being old growth, but not there yet. You can see wood down on the ground. You can see trees starting to gain some size and a really nice herb layer. And contrast that with a 20 year rich cove forest. This is kind of the worst case scenario where you've got pretty much all one species poplar uh, that's uh, takes advantage of high light environments following logging and dominates the sites because they can grow fast. Um, and also you've got a non-native species taking over the herb layer in uh, stilt grass. So just wanted to show you some, some of the differences with uh, various human management strategies and the age of the forest in a rich cove. I'm moving on to kind of the next most moist and cool forest type in our region is, are the mesic oak forest. These would, in, would include high elevation oak forests as well as just uh, montane oak forest at a variety of elevations that tend to be characterized by red oak, um, northern red oak in particular. Um, they can be rich or acidic. Uh, fire is important in this forest type but is less common and less severe than in other oak forest types. And trees can get really large in this ecosystem. Dry mesic oak hickory forest, uh, the dry part is pretty obvious. It means it's dry. Mesic, I should have explained in the last slide, mesic is just a term for moist. So when, when scientists talk about mesic forests, they're talking about forests that are moist. Moist soils a lot of the time. So dry mesic oak hickory forests have both dry and moist characteristics. Uh, oak and hickories dominate. Uh, the white oak group is uh, very long lived, so you can have trees well over 300 years old up over 400 years old sometimes in this forest type. Um, again, it can be either rich or acidic, and fire was historically very common and very important in this uh, community type. And this is an example of a forest, what it might look like if it receives regular fire. This particular site had had a wildfire about 10 years before I took this picture. A chestnut oak forest uh, is, a, is a forest type that is common in the Blue Ridge. Uh, it's characterized by chestnut oak dominance. It can vary from pretty moist to, to pretty dry. Um, it's often found on rocky substrates. Um, historically, chestnut oak was not very desirable for timber. It tends to be kind of uh, splitty and twisty. Uh, it was desirable in some cases for tan bark, for, uh, for hide tanning. Um, you know, so if, if there's a tanning factory nearby and good access, sometimes uh, chestnut oaks were harvested just for their bark. But in general, this is not a very exploited forest type, and it's probably the most abundant old growth type uh, in our region. Uh, this is a great, for, a great photo because it shows some of the really nice bark textures you can get in old trees. That tree in the foreground is a black gum, likely over 400 years old. Uh, black gums are the largest known hardwood species in the east. Uh, 
you know, documented at over 550 years in Smoky Mountains and over 600 years in New England, and a chestnut oak there in the, in the background, uh, really large ridges and deep furrows. Um, dry oak forests are also dominated by chestnut oak and scarlet oak. Um, they are steep south and west facing slopes typically. Fire was very common historically in this type. Um, lack of fire has led to degradation in this, this particular forest type. Again, old growth is going to be relatively more abundant in this forest type due to lack of commercial interest. Um, without fire, they look a lot like this photo, whereas with fire, they look like the previous photo with more open. Uh, Katie, how, how are the slides keeping up? Are they doing any better? They are a little better, but we're still probably 10 seconds behind. Okay, good to know. Uh, so the, the next forest type uh, is low elevation pine forest. This is a, a forest type that's characterized by shortleaf pine and oak being uh, the dominant species. These are often found on gentle rolling landforms at low elevation, generally you know, 2,500 feet and below in the Blue Ridge. Fire was historically very, very common, uh, as frequent as every three years in this ecosystem. Um, woodland structure where you have uh, larger uh, canopy openings and a lot of grass and herbs were historically common. Red cockaded woodpeckers, which are a federally threatened species, are cavity nesters and are old growth associates because older trees tend to form those cavities. Um, red cockaded woodpecker was once found in the Blue Ridge and was in this shortly pine or this low elevation pine forest type, uh, but has been extirpated due to, since the early 1990s due to a lack of fire and degradation in this ecosystem. And I would say also a lack of old growth characteristics in this, in this ecosystem. Um, because these forests are on gentle landforms at lower elevation, they have been widely converted to cattle pastures, agriculture, housing development, and all number of other human uses. And that combined with the lack of fire, it makes this one of probably the most degraded forest types in our region in general. Um, so this next slide shows you what this forest type looked like probably a lot more frequently historically, where it was very grassy, very open. This was a site near Hot Springs that experienced a wildfire um, in 2001. This photo was taken in 2010. If you go there now, uh, it's not nearly as open. It's grown up quite a lot. As it Pine Oak Heath is, um, I believe, the final forest type I'm going to discuss. And there are many other uh, many other more specific forest types that we could talk about, but this, these are the broad overarching categories that are the most common in the region. Uh, these are characterized by table mountain pine, pitch pine, oaks, and heaths like mountain laurel, huckleberry, and blueberry, uh, and herbs like uh, trailing arbutus. And they're found on generally the steepest south and west facing aspects and range from the bottom of the mountains all the way up to over 4,500 feet in elevation. Um, fire, including very severe standard replacement fires, were historically common, and woodland structure was once common. Again, this is a community type that's degraded by fire. Also a community type because of its propensity for stand replacing fires. This is a fire that kills most of the trees, has a more even age structure. So that you're not going to find as much mixed age structure in the pine oak heath type as you might in some of the hardwood forest types. So, um, how much old growth forest is there in the Blue Ridge? Um, you know, again, knowledge of the abundance comes from dozens of researchers, especially Rob Messick. Um, old growth forests make up less than 1% of forest in the east. Another typo there, with the eagle, eagle eyed among you. Um, in our region, we're lucky. Mountains in our region and early conservation efforts uh, have led to there being around 3% of our landscape being in old growth forest condition. Um, Existing old growth is not protected, however, in many Southern Appalachian National Forests, which are some of the best reservoirs remaining for old growth forests and some of the best places to ponder restoring them. So this is a map of um, Western North Carolina and a map of known old growth distribution in Western North Carolina, showing Smoky Mountains National Park, Nantahala National Forest, and Pisgah National Forest. Smoky Mountains National Park has the vast majority of old growth, in our region. Um, a researcher by the name of Charlotte Pyle documented that around 145,000 acres of Smoky Mountains National Park had never been logged, definitively never been logged at all, with another uh, 50,000 or more acres that had only lightly been logged. So this was in the 1990s, there was around 200,000 acres 
out of a 500,000 acre park that were essentially in old growth conditions, some of them being primary, old, you know, a lot of it being primary old growth. And as the forest in the park age, there's more and more old growth developing there. Anahila and Pisgah National Forest are known to have around 90,000 acres of old growth forest. And again, as those forests age, some of the, the forests that were less heavily logged historically are starting to regain old growth attributes. So the factors that preserve old growth, um, I would say the number one factor would be rugged terrain. So places that were just impossible to get to, especially outside of Smoky Mountains National Park or places that were uh, at early conservation. Uh, and you know, early purchase um, and inclusion in public land is a factor that has uh, preserved some of our best old growth remnants. Lack of commercial viability is another really big reason and also goes along with rugged terrain. Um, a lot of forests that we have are not and never will be um, commercially viable for timber harvest. And those types are relatively better represented in old growth condition. Those types like dry oak forest and chestnut oak forest. Again, conservation and preservation efforts played a big role and also luck. There were some uh, historical coin flips like the Great Depression, like uh, the formation of Lake Santitla that prevented a, a logging railroad from going into Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest and allowed preservation efforts to catch up. Um, and, and you know, so there, there's a lot of factors that, that go into why we still have small growth, but the number one factor I would say is the fact that we have mountains and that those mountains are rugged and they thwart human activities. Um, so I've got a few, um, a few questions that have stacked up. Um, Andrew Goldberg asked about, can I talk about how we get more of old growth characteristics in the woods moving forward? Yes, and I have a slide on that later. And he also asked, what do I mean by woodland structure? Um, Andrew, woodland structure refers to a forest structure in which um, the canopy of the forest is not closed. It refers to widely spaced trees, uh, they tend to be a lot sunnier than uh, closed canopy forests that dominate our region. Um, and they're generally maintained by fire. So that you're talking about the drier forest types that have a, a possibility for woodland structure. And um, there's a question about, is there old growth in the South Mountains? There most certainly is. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any efforts to systematically map uh, old growth in the South Mountains. Um, all right, moving on to the next slide here. So if you want to experience old growth forest in our region, I've got a list of places here on this slide that I would recommend. Uh, Smoky Mountains National Park has a, a wealth of trails where you can walk, hike through old growth forest. There's a great document they have called Trees and Forests of the Smoky Mountains that you can pick up at any visitor center. And on that, on that document is actually a map of the old growth in the park and the trails that go through it. But some of the ones that I would recommend are the Boogerman Loop, the Co Forest Nature Trail, uh, the Nolan Divide Trail, Albright Grove Loop, and Ramsey Cascade Trail. Uh, those all are all sort of on the eastern side of the park. There are some spots on the western side of the park as well, um, but the majority of the old growth in Smokies is on the northeastern side of the park. Um, on Pisgah National Forest, some, some trails I would recommend include Devil's Hole Trail and Linville Gorge. And Linville Gorge, because it's so rugged, does have a wealth of old growth that it hasn't burned down in the past uh, 20 years. Um, the Deep Gap Trail going up to the crest of the Blacks out of uh, the South Toe Valley, towards the top of that trail gets into primary spruce fir forest, so very ancient uh, spruce trees in a, a real rugged setting. The Douglas Falls Trail is a, a trail in the, uh, the Craggy Mountains that you can get to either off Blue Ridge Parkway or out of Barnesville that has fantastic northern hardwoods forest. Uh, and Looking Glass Rock is a trail that a lot of people have hiked and may not realize that it's old growth, but on top of Looking Glass Rock, there is no evidence of there ever having been any logging. Uh, it's a fairly dry uh, set of forest types up there and a lot of old trees up there um, as a result of that lack of logging. On Nanahala National Forest, there's a lot of spots. Some of them don't have good trail access like the Kelsey Tract uh, and the Henry Wright Preserve. The Henry, Henry Wright Preserve is owned by the Highlands Cashiers Land Trust and borders the Kelsey Tract on Nantahila National Forest. This is the best remaining hemlock forest outside of the Smoky Mountains and a really majestic place. Um, slopes of Wyatt Bald on the upper Trimont Ridge Trail go through some very old oak forest and very diverse oak forest. Uh, Kit Springs Branch is a spot that there's no trail access to, but you can get to off of a Forest Service Road in Nantahila National Forest uh, near Wine Spring Bald. Um, Timber Ridge Trail in Southern Nantahila Wilderness has a 
very high quality, high elevation redwood forest. And the Appalachian Trail on Chiowa Ball is a great spot to, to see some ancient forest. Um, Chunky Gal Trail near Tusquiddy Bald. If you climb Tusquiddy Bald in the Chunky Gal Trail, you will hike through several different types of old growth forest and see lots of ancient trees. And uh, Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest, of course, is very famous. Um, so we know that about 3% of our region is old growth. How much should there be? According to Nanahila Pisgah National Forest, um, the estimate is that under a natural disturbance regime and prior to exploitation, between 43 and 53 percent of land base around here would have been in old growth condition. Uh, I think the actual figure might actually be much higher than that, depending on how you conceive of old growth. The reason is the, the way that figure was generated from Nanahila Pisgah was through a computer modeling software that has uh, no, it's not spatially explicit, it's, it essentially models the forest on the level of individual trees. So what you're saying there is that 43 to 53% of the trees would be pretty old historically on the forest. I think that adds up to probably a much higher percentage of the actual forest being in old growth condition. Um, currently about 10% of the Nanahila Pisgah and about 40% of Great Smoky Mountains National Park are in old growth condition. Uh, private lands have not been systematically inventoried. There probably is a significant old growth on, on private lands. It may add up to another one or 2% of the region because private lands make up two thirds of the forest in the region. So how can old growth be restored? Uh, the number one way is through the passage of time. You don't get old, old trees quickly. Um, another way is by restoring natural processes like fire, floods, and uh, species that have been extirpated like elk. Um, you know, animals actually have uh, quite a lot of feedback with our plant communities and really have naturally functioning forests in other communities. We really need all of our wildlife species. Um, and finally, it's possible to accelerate old growth structures and habitats like snags and woody debris. So in some cases, uh, progressive land managers do such things as girdling trees to create snags or dropping trees to create woody debris. Uh, you know, try to increase the amount of the structures that are lacking in younger forests to provide habitat for those species that need them. So you can accelerate those structures. You cannot accelerate the trees uh, getting old. Um, you can accelerate trees getting big though. And so like thinning a forest can actually help trees attain large size, which is a, a trait of old growth. So there, there is active management that can be done to approximate old growth. So what do I think the prospects for old growth restoration are? I think that on public land with enough public support, old growth could be restored to pre-industrial logging levels. Uh, it just depends on the public uh, having consensus around that being a goal on public. Um, you know, private lands really do not offer the same possibility uh, due to diversity of landowners. We're talking about tens of thousands of landowners, if not hundreds of thousands, and probably hundreds of thousands of landowners in our region. Uh, and then the economic pressures that private landowners face is going to generally cause them to economically benefit from their land. And, you know, old growth forest um, doesn't have a lot of uh, economic return unless you can have someone pay you for carbon sequestration. And, and large landowners are able to at sometimes. Uh, sell carbon credits uh, and manage forests for, for older conditions in that way. And I think it's important that we restore old growth forests um, because they are genetic reservoirs for, for species and individuals that have stood the test of time. Um, they're really important for scientific study. We know uh, much more about the history of climate and weather in our region and all across the world because of study of tree rings. Uh, we know a lot more about how forests function naturally. Um, they're super important old growth forests are for habitat for all sorts of uh, species. They are great at watershed protection. Uh, one of the really key missing attributes in a lot of our streams is actually woody debris. And that woody debris is missing is because there's not enough old forest lining uh, stream banks and contributing uh, chunks of wood into the, into the watershed that is great habitat for fish. Um, Old growth forests are also places for recreation and places for people to connect to the natural world and world in maybe deeper ways and have a, maybe a deeper sense of awe than they might have in a secondary forest or a younger forest. And uh, a lot of folks find spiritual value, um, both um, indigenous cultures and other folks that, uh, that find a lot of spiritual value in the wonder of nature. There are a few obstacles to protecting old growth in our region. Um, I'd say the biggest one is lack of awareness. You know, when I was growing up, I was always really interested in, in these older forests, and I would ask folks, and a lot of folks would tell me there are no old growth forests. Uh, 
Uh, I think there's um, a lot more awareness today than there was when I was a kid, and uh, folks know that's not completely true. Um, of course, another big obstacle to old growth is short-term economics. Uh, old growth exists on very long time horizons, and the need for short-term economic gain on the part of landowners and even public land managers leads to less old growth on the ground. Um, you know, I think arrogance is another problem. I think uh, amongst some land managers, there's the uh, notion that whatever humans do to the land is going to be an improvement. Uh, and I think that's certainly not true in these older forests that have been here far longer than any uh, Western land management discipline. Um, another problem is that there's not very many legal options for permanent protection. You know, the couple of the options are a designated wilderness and many of the old growth forests we have are not in a context that would be conducive the designated wilderness. You're not in a large enough contiguous area. They're in a matrix of more heavily managed lands, all sorts of uh, factors that make them unsuitable for wilderness. And you know, another possible vehicle are, are research natural areas, which can be designated by the chief of the forest service. Historically, that has been reserved for just a couple of forests. And we have a couple of really nice ones in, uh, in Southern Blue Ridge, both of them in the Craggy and Black Mountains, one at uh, Walker Cove Research Natural Area and the other at Middle Creek Research Natural Area. And I'd recommend visiting both if you have an interest. Um, finally, I think old growth blindness is a big problem. Um, so you see me here coring a pretty small tree. This tree is uh, again about 16 inches in diameter. That tree is about 230 years old and most people wouldn't realize that. This is just a, a, you know, a dry oak forest on a south facing slope um, and most people would not think this is a very special forest, but it is. Um, I'll leave you with uh, a photo of the uh, the tallest known hardwood in the east. I think it's actually the tallest known tree at the east of this point. It's a 192 foot tall poplar in Smoky Mountains National Park. And if we have time for questions, I think we can have some discussion. And I really appreciate folks uh, hanging in there with the technical problems and uh, hope you enjoyed this. Thanks to everyone for joining. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and Josh will take them. And thanks again for your patience with our connectivity issues. So we got a question from uh, David about which Blue Ridge species grows the oldest. Um, the oldest known species in the Blue Ridge is the black gum. Um, you know, documented at 550 something years old in Smoky Mountains National Park. It's, it's likely that hemlock grows uh, equally as old. There are hemlocks documented over that age in other parts of North America, but the oldest ones in the Blue Ridge are around 500. Uh, also, uh, poplar grows surprisingly old. There are poplars documented over 500 years old in Smokies. It's like maybe some questions are coming in via the chat. Is that uh, correct, Katie? Let's see. Uh, Callie Moore asked if I can repeat the names of the research natural areas. Um, and she also asked if I would go back to the slide of the tallest tree. Sure thing. I can go back to the slide of the tallest tree. Um, so the research natural areas are called Middle Creek Research Natural Area. That one is in uh, the South Toe drainage in the Black Mountains. It's about 1,000 acres. The other one is called Walker Cove Research Natural Area. It's about 40 acres, and it's in the Craggy Mountains uh, in the Big Ivy section. So Nanahala National Forest doesn't have any research natural areas, though it has some, you know, and, and Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest has a very well-preserved uh, exemplary example of old growth. All right. Um, David asked if these slides will meet, be made available for us to, uh, for future reference. I believe this presentation is being recorded and will be on our website. Um, Lynn asks if um, I can talk about how property owners can get carbon credits uh, where old growth land is not contiguous to large tracts of land but still want to find ways to conserve without selling to a developer. Lynn, I don't know enough about that topic. Um, I know that if, you, if large landowners can get carbon credits, there may be programs out there for smaller landowners to aggregate together. Uh, I do know that um, if you're interested in progressive land management like old growth management on private land, I would recommend getting in touch with Eco Forest Makers, which is a, a great um, uh, nonprofit, ecologically oriented forest management organization. And they may be able to help you with something like that. Um, 
Tracy Baker asks if there are resources for private landowners to help them manage their property for old growth enhancement. Um, Tracy, I'd say that there are. Um, I bet there's literature out there uh, if you were to search for it on the internet. And again, I would recommend uh, getting in touch with eco-foresters uh, or other progressive uh, forestry management organizations. Uh, Ashley Hawk asks if there's any appetite at all for inventorying private lands for old growth forests. Would that be possible? I think that would be fantastic. I have a huge appetite for it. The, pro the challenge is getting landowner permission and, and approaching it in a systematic way with so many landowners out there. Um, the uh, name of the organization again is Eco Foresters. Eco Foresters, one word. That's uh, the uh, prefix eco as in ecology and then foresters. And they have a very informative website and are uh, based out of Asheville. Uh, so if you're in the Asheville area, they'll be very available to you. Looks like um, we're getting to most of the questions. If there's any more, keep them coming. Love talking about this stuff. Callie's dropped the link to Eco Foresters in the chat if you all want to pull that up before we head out. Um, if there aren't any more questions or if you think of one while I'm talking, feel free to add it. But thank you everyone for joining and thank you for your patience with our technology issues. We did what we could, but also there's only so much that we can do to control the interwebs. We will be posting the recording of the talk and so you all should be able to access that. I'll email it out to everyone who attended. And then also you'll be able to find that on our social media and our website later. And then I'll also be sending you all a survey. For AmeriCorps, I'm required to send out surveys for programs that we run. So if you'd take that, I'd really appreciate it. It looks like we got one more question in here, Josh, if you want to take that as folks head out. Um, Andrew Goldberg asked about iconic ground cover plants in old growth forests in our region. Uh, it's interesting, there's been a lot of debate around herbaceous communities and old growth forests. There was a paper in the 1990s by uh, researchers named Duffy and Meyer out of the University of Georgia that posed the question whether or not uh, Appalachian herbaceous uh, understory ever recovered from clear cutting. And they, they compared forests that hadn't been clear cut, generally old growth forests, to forests that had. And they found that there were big differences. Follow up on that question has, has um, actually clarified a bit that Duffy and Myers results were a bit overstated, mainly because they did not have a randomized study. Um, and old growth is not in random locations. Old growth is in locations that are steep and may, may be diverse for, for other reasons uh, besides just their cereal stage. But there are plants that occur uh, in old growth at higher abundance than in other forest types. A great example of such a plant would be umbrella leaf. Umbrella leaf is a southern Blue Ridge endemic species. It only occurs from Mount Rogers down into North Georgia. And it, um, it has a very large umbrella-shaped leaf, uh, grows in seeps generally. And, um, you know, the thought is that post-logging, it gets too hot and dry for this plant. Uh, there are several other plants that have been documented to be associated, uh, uh, or herbaceous plants that are associated with old-growth forests. But in general, herbaceous diversity is associated more and cover is associated more with soil chemistry and soil conditions than it is with the old growth stage. But again, just like in animals, there are certain plants that find their best habitat in old growth. And we don't completely understand why that is, but for some of them, we have a pretty good idea. Yeah, that was a great question. gets at my botanical interest. I, I guess unless we have any more questions, we'll wrap it up. And again, really appreciate folks for tuning in. That looks like all the questions, but thank you all for joining and hopefully we'll be able to connect with you all in the future. <laughs>